We're going to get started here. My name is Kyle Basinski. Um, I'm the director of the Research Institute at the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, and welcome to another episode of our ongoing webinar series. Um, today, we're really pleased to have Dr. Todd Suravel um, talking about the Barger Gulch site in, a, in another lecture that's um, co-sponsored by the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society. And we'll hear from, um, from Doug, who's representing uh, the Archaeological and Historical Society here in a moment. Um, but first, I want to introduce a special guest that's with us just for today. Um, Dr. Liz Perry is the president and CEO of Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, and she, um, I found out uh, this afternoon, uh, has a couple of words to say to us. So, Liz, um, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Kyle, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. I, I have inserted myself for this very brief cameo because this is the last uh, webinar of 2020. Uh, they're not going away, so come back in 2021, but we have hundreds of participants uh, showing up, and I'm sure many of you that are on right now have uh, been to many of our webinars throughout the year. So I just wanted for our last webinar of the year to say thank you, huge thank you to, to Taylor behind the scenes who's been making this happen, uh, to Kyle who's moderated so many, to all of our moderators and, and participants, huge thank you to the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society because it's always the partnerships that draw more people and make these uh, more interesting. Um, want to give a huge shout out to everybody who who donates um, uh, when when you sign up for the webinars. Um, as as you probably or some of you know who are familiar with Kirk Canyon before COVID, uh, we were supported partly uh, by tuition for our programs, which we do not have any more tuition revenue anymore from Kirk Canyon. So we're supporting uh, our staff and our scientists and our researchers and our educators entirely through donations and grants and endowments. And so we're so grateful. For for everyone uh, who's contributed. Um, but whether you whether you donate or not, we're so happy when you sign up. And if when you do sign up, you're gonna hear from us in some sense or another. Well, you'll be getting a, a welcome packet or a letter or something from me because once we have piqued your interest, we want you to be a part of our family uh, and get to know you a little bit better. We're, we're not just here to uh, teach our stakeholders at Crook Canyon. We learn from all of our stakeholders at Crook Canyon. We believe ev all of us think that uh, everyone has something to contribute to the understanding of our shared human past, whether you're a scientist or an archeologist or a descendant of the ancestral Pueblos, uh, or just a human being that lives in the world and has something to offer from your life experience to the conversations that we have at Crook Canyon. So thank you so much. Um, have a wonderful rest of December. Uh, if you are following us on Facebook for the rest of the month, every single day we're introducing a new member of our totally awesome staff. So check check it out. We've got a little profile as we count down to 2021. And we will all see you in January with our next uh, webinar with Will Sosi on January 7th. So thank you so much. And thank you, Kyle, for letting me jump in. <laughs> thanks, Liz. And thanks for being here. Um, and as Liz said, thank you all for being here and making this webinar series possible. We wouldn't be doing it um, without y'all, without, without an audience every week um, who joins us for these really insightful discussions. The, the quality of the questions and answers have just, I swear, they've improved every week. Um, the presentations are incredible, um, and we'll, we'll be continuing them into 2021. Special thanks, as Liz said, to Dylan Schwent and Taylor Hasbrook, who have been organizing all of these webinar series um, and working behind the scenes to make sure that it's, a, that it's a good experience for everyone. If you were there with us for some of the early webinars, you know that the, uh, the sort of tech has improved. Um, also, special thanks to some of our primary funders, the National Endowment for Humanities, Colorado Humanities, and the Region 9 Economic Development District of Colorado. Um, the funding all came through the CARES Act um, that was signed earlier this year, so thank you all. Um, we also want to thank the people on whose land we work and reside. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center uh, is on the ancestral land of Pueblo, Ute, Diné, or Navajo, Hickory, Hickory Apache, and Paiute people. Um, and we're grateful 
to, to those tribes and to all indigenous people who continue to protect and preserve cultural traditions, maintain ancestral relationships, and steward these lands. Um, the COVID pandemic has really hit uh, Indian country hard, and you can help make a difference um, for those communities. Um, here are a couple of the of the funds that we've been working with in order to um, in order to to help improve livelihoods during COVID. The Pueblo Relief Fund, the Hopi Relief Fund, the Navajo Hope and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, and the official Navajo Nation COVID nineteen Relief Fund. The URLs are here, and we'll be posting um, these links on Facebook and on YouTube when this uh, webinar gets posted later this evening. For those of you who may be joining us on Zoom for the first time, we're all getting used to it, but I want to go through a couple of tips and tricks that we found out along the way. Number one is that if you're joining us on Zoom, you can move the talking heads. Um, so you probably see my head uh, floating somewhere on your screen. If it's in your way, just um, click the little bar at the top and move me around. Um, if you want me to disappear altogether, that's fine too. There's a little narrow rectangle. If you click that, I'll minimize and you can see all of Todd's amazing presentation in a minute. Um, we're gonna be taking questions throughout this entire presentation. Um, and we're gonna take them through the Q&A feature that should be uh, down at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, just click your screen and it'll show up. Um, you can ask questions there and I will be um, taking those questions and organizing them uh, for a Q&A session at the end of Todd's talk. If you're having difficulties, please head over to our live stream, which you can get to easily by going to crowcanyon.org slash Facebook. And if all else fails and uh, you just need to run, you can always catch us on YouTube. The recording from this webinar will go up later this evening. Um, and we also have the recordings from all of our webinar series that we've been doing since January. Um, so to get there easily, crowcanyon.org slash YouTube. Our mission at Crow Canyon, as Liz said earlier, is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. COVID has been, um, has been a real challenge to this mission, but it's through, it's through uh, things like this webinar series and guest speakers like Todd um, that have allowed us to continue meeting that mission even through this challenging time. Um, so thank you all for supporting it. Um, this is our last webinar of the year. We'll pick up again in January with William Sosi, a good friend of mine, um, giving his second uh, webinar in this series, Seasons of Navajo 2. That will be on uh, January 7th. We're gonna be doing same time, same place in the new year, 4 p.m. on Thursday. Um, and then the next week, a really exciting talk by uh, Dr. Sev Fowles, um, The Biographical Revolution in Plains Visual Culture, 1680 to 1880. Please join us on the 14th. So I'm going to pass it over now um, to Doug Baxter, who's here with us from the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society, to introduce Todd. Thank you, Kyle. Again, my name is Doug Baxter, and I'm president of the Pueblo Archaeological and uh, Historical Society, and we're a chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society. And I'd like uh, to again thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. And on behalf of the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society, I would like to thank the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center for partnering up with us on this uh, program. Uh, we're thankful for this opportunity. I'd also like to thank Taylor and Kyle for setting it up and Todd for speaking to us this afternoon. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Todd Suravel. Dr. Suravel is a professor and department head of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Wyoming. He is the former director of the George C. Frisson Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology. He received a BA in Anthropology and Zoology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1995 and an MA in 1998, PhD 2003 from the University of Arizona. Although most of his field work has been in Wyoming and Colorado, he has worked throughout the American West and in Israel and Denmark. 
From 2012 to 2017, he completed a five-year ethno-archaeological project with Duha reindeer herders in northern Mongolia. Over a 10-year period, he excavated Barger, Gul Barger Gulch, locality B, a Folsom site in Middle Park, Colorado, which we'll be talking about today, and is currently foc focusing his efforts on the Laprelle Mammoth Site, a Clovis Kill and campsite in Converse County, Wyoming. He has published more than 60 articles on Paleo-Indian archaeology, lithic technology, geoarchaeology, uh, pl uh, Pleistocene extinctions, ethnoarchaeology, and other topics. He is the author of a book on the econ economics of stone tool use titled Toward a Behavior Behavioral Ecology of Lithic Technology. Originally from Northern Virginia, he feels at home in the high plains and mountains of Wyoming, where he has now lived for 17 years. And a few years ago, he finally felt it was okay to buy a pair of cowboy boots. Please welcome Dr. Todd Servell. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I presume you all can hear me. I just unmuted myself. Um, and thanks, thanks, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. And thanks to all of you for joining me. Um, just thinking how strange it is. This is probably the largest crowd to whom I have ever spoken, and I have, from what I can tell, about 350 people in my living room here in this <laughs> little house I'm renting in Texas, where I'm spending the fall semester. So, um, strange times. Uh, I hope everybody is well. I'm going to share my screen um, and let's see if I can make this work. Let's see. Give me one second here. Mm -hmm. Nope. Try this again. There we go. Can you see me now? Yep, it's coming up. There it is. Great. All right. Let's do this. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> all right. So um, it's interesting to me to be talking to Southwestern archaeologists um, who have such a rich and uh, detailed record of, of human um, behavior in prehistory. Um, I'm a hunter-gatherer archaeologist and I work in the Paleo-Indian period. The earliest period of New World prehistory, um, and the record is quite depauperate compared to what you're used to. And I'm going to be talking today about this rather nondescript, sort of anonymous location in the valley bottom in Middle Park, Colorado, um, and the kinds of things that we've learned about the people who, who spent the winter there, we think, around 12,800 years ago. This is the title that I chose for my talk, but I thought if I wanted to, if I had a, a better promoter, maybe I would have chose an alternative title, uh, and, and I've changed the title here to the oldest houses in the Americas. Um, what's really interesting about this site, this is a Folsom site, an early Paleo-Indian campsite occupied by bison hunters, is that we think we have pretty clear evidence of houses, and I want to explain to you what that evidence is today and the kinds of things that we can, we can learn by, by studying them. Whether these are truly the oldest, I'm not sure. Um, in fact, um, I, I would suspect that the first people who came into the New World sometime prior to 12,800 years ago in Northwest Alaska, certainly made houses well, probably that day. So these are certainly not the oldest, they're just among the oldest that we, that we know of. I wanna go back to Lou Binford. I think a lot of problems in archeology, span Binford um, fingered them very early on. He certainly wasn't the first, but this is a paper that, uh, that he published in 1990 about hunter-gatherer mobility, housing and environment. And where he did a big comparative study of how foraging peoples build, build their households. And I want to start with this quote. He says, there are no known cases among modern hunter-gatherers where shelter is not fabricated in residential sites, anywhere that hunter-gatherers plan to sleep, regardless of the occupational duration, and only in rare circumstances are sites of any kind produced by hunter-gatherers where no shelter is provided for the occupants. On the other hand, basically everywhere hunter-gatherers go, they build houses. But in the archaeological record of hunter-gatherers, we often just view the remains of expediently, uh, archaeologists viewing the remains of expediently constructed shelters really only see hards and lithic scatters. In other words, we know these people were using houses, we just can't see them in the archaeological record of hunter-gatherers. So compared to 
Crow Canyon area, compared to the Four Corners, um, we have nothing like this. I mean, if we wanted to study architecture in, 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 the, in the Paleo-Indian archaeology world, right, this, this kind of scenario, like you see here at in Mesa Verde at Hoven Weep, where you have these multi-room masonry pueblos or in other places, adobe pueblos, direct evidence for architecture, we simply don't have it. It, it makes me, me, me very envious of the kind of record you do have. Or even if we go back in time a little bit in the American Southwest, where you have beautiful records of, of pit houses going back into the early Pueblo periods and, and into the basket maker um, period, you have obvious, obvious architecture in the archaeological record. We simply don't have that. Even going back further, so here's a, a site actually not too far from Barger Gulch. We have here where uh, in the Puebloan period and Basket Maker and about 7,000 years ago, Yarmany Pit House, another site in Colorado, clear pit house record dating to the middle Holocene. But once we get back to the Paleo-Indian period, I'm going to talk about today, it's almost as if the people who lived in these sites were homeless. We know they weren't. We just can't see the architecture. Barger Gulch, the site I'm going to talk about today, is probably the oldest known Folsom site so far, at least the oldest one that, that has been dated. It dates to around 12,800 years ago. It's only about 100 years after the mammoth kill at the Dent site. And I would say, I know this is probably somewhat of a contentious statement, but I would say the site was occupied within about 1,000 years of the first people arriving in the state of Colorado. So we're going way, way back in time. The archaeological record is not particularly rich. In fact, this is what the archaeological record I know looks like. Not terribly exciting. What you're looking at here is a small cluster of chipstone buried in silts that are about 12,800 years old. And from a record like this, we try to learn what we can. We try to squeeze as much information out of a really, really challenging record where what is really preserved, what we commonly find is little more than chipstone and animal bone. So one of the things I wanna talk about today, and really this is the, the central question in my talk is how do you find architecture when architecture is invisible? When you have no direct evidence for it, you don't have the pit of the pit house. You don't have the post molds. You don't have the walls. They're simply not there. How do you find it? This is what the excavation at Barker Gulch looks like, or looked like, I should say. This is a, a, a big tent we put over the, the excavation to make conditions a little more comfortable for digging. But I mean, what you're seeing here, a bunch of square meters dug to different five centimeter levels. There's absolutely no evidence for architecture. And we're mapping in, this is early in the day before we start working, recording what the block looks like this certain day, but th there's nothing to see there, right? There's very little to see compared to the archeology span of the farmers of the American Southwest. We know from recent hunting and gathering peoples that hards and structures serve as centers of activity. This has been well documented um, uh, in, by ethnographers, by ethnoarchaeologists, here you're seeing a small brush shelter in a Hadza camp in Tanzania and people sitting around a fire. This kind of scene is repeated over and over and over again in every hunter gatherer society um, that, you, that you can find, that you can study. You think about Plains Indians of North America or Inuit camps um, in Alaska, uh, Canada, and Yukon, the same kind of situation fires, houses but built out of materials that don't leave much of an archaeological signature. Here's a classic plan map. This is a map published by John Yellen in 1977 of a Bushman camp in Botswana, Shokwansi, also known as the Kongsan, um, and a photograph of that camp in the upper right. And you can see in this map the dominant features. You see a scatter of materials they've left behind, but the dominant features sort of structuring the spatial distribution of human activity in this campsite. Hearth features here shown in red and structures shown in blue. We know these things are really important in hunter-gatherer sites in terms of structuring the spatial distribution of human behavior, but we can't see them. They're really, really hard to see except in rare circumstances. And here's the F.A. camp from, from Zaire, um, brush uh, structures here. You can imagine what this camp would look like 12,000 years after these people abandoned it. And there might not be anything left that's really archaeologically visible, especially because these people aren't using stone tools. The only thing in that camp that 
might remain are um, some remnants of that fire and perhaps um, some bone of animals that they have, may have butchered and, and consumed there. So here's the challenge, right? This really depauperate archeological record. And we know that houses are really important features. But we just can't see them and they really matter. I mean, when we think about Paleo-Indian archaeology, if you have any exposure to it, right? I mean, Paleo-Indian archaeologists over and over and over again talk about the same topics. And the obvious ones and the ones that are easy to study, right? Like economics, stone tools, weapons, hunting. But you don't really hear about houses. And you don't really hear about social organization. You don't really hear about demography or the identity of the people who live in these places, right? Why? Part of it is we can't identify these features. So while hunting and gathering peoples, all of them make structures, they're really hard to find. They're important for many reasons. For example, in human evolution, one of the markers we think of behavioral modernity or the markers that we see in the Paleolithic that indicates that humans have become humans, the behaviorally modern humans that are us, is building houses, building these microenvironments in which people live. These are our primary living spaces. They're where we spend a lot of our time. If we can identify them reliably and regularly, we could study, for example, differences in household economy. Imagine if we could look in 100 paleo Indian houses and the things in them, for example. We could look at variation in household economy and demography and the organization of those spaces and the activities that occur in them. We could potentially study things like how interior spaces are used versus exterior spaces. We could potentially study architectural variation across time, time and space. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for research that could, could arise if we can if we can do this reliably, okay? So Barger Gulch, where are we talking about? This is a map of Colorado, Crow Canyon's down there in the southwest corner of the state. Barker Gulch is north central. It's right in the, in the middle of the Rocky Mountains there, a valley called Middle Park. This is Middle Park right here. Park meaning a intermontane basin, meaning a valley in the mountains that's fairly broad. To the north of Middle Park is North Park. To the south of Middle Park is South Park. Middle Park forms the headwaters of the Colorado River. It's all west of the Continental Divide. Let's zoom in a little bit here. We're looking at a Google Earth composite image looking south, southeast. Um, on the left side of the screen here, if you can see my cursor, this is the front range of Colorado. With the plains like here, over here, this is Denver. If you hop over the mountains from Denver and come down on the other side across the continental divide, you might drop into Middle Park. The Colorado River heads up here in, in um, Rocky Mountain National Park and flows from east to west across the park. And Barger Gulch is right in here. If we zoom in a little bit here, we're looking, this is an aerial image um, looking north. You can see in the background, the valley of the Colorado River. Um, there are 11 known Paleo-Indian localities associated with Barger Gulch. This, this area is incredibly rich in Paleo-Indian sites. They all tend to be very shallowly buried. You can see why sitting up on this high ridge top, there's very little potential for, for deposition. Um, and these are excavations. I don't remember what year this is. This may be 2005. We worked there from 1997 to 2007. Because it's so shallowly buried, we were able to open up a large excavation, at least large for, for us. It was 164 square meters. What you're seeing here is the map of the entire entirety of the area we excavated. The small squares are one by one square meter test units for, for context. And you can see that our excavations were organized in these large blocks. We had three major blocks, which we call the main block, um, the east block, and the south block, and then some smaller blocks and then some test units. Every little black dot there is a mapped piece of chip stone. The red polygons are hearth features. Um, and all we recovered a, a really large lithic assemblage of more than 75,000 artifacts, really rich. Um, all the diagnostic artifacts from excavations are Folsom, um, about 50 points and preforms, almost 200 channel flakes, lots and lots of tools, cores, bifaces. I'm going to show you a few pictures of pretty artifacts, but, but not very many. Um, this site has been really challenging to date, but recent dates on calcined bones from hearth features suggest this is 12,800 years old. 
which makes it the oldest known Folsom site. In fact, it's older than some Clovis sites, if if our dating is correct and the dating of those Clovis sites is correct, which is interesting. It means this site actually could potentially predate the extinction of some of the Pleistocene megafauna. The bone preserved in this site is very poorly preserved. The only bone we're able to identify the species is bison, which is typical for a Folsom site. We excavated this thing fairly carefully. Um, we mapped in a lot of artifacts with the total station. So, you know, we're digging with trowels, everything we find in situ. We mapped the nearest millimeter using a total station, which is why we have these wonderful maps of the distribution of chip stone. That said, we have, I don't know, 14,000 some piece of artifacts and an assemblage of 75,000. So 80% 80 80 of the artifacts, 60,000 or so, we actually found, found in screens. When you do that, when you map artifacts really, really carefully, you can make beautiful plan maps of the spatial distribution of chip stone. So this is what we call the east block. Um, and you can see this hearth feature in the center and this really high density scatter uh, of chip stone associated with, with this hearth feature. And, and in a bit, I wanna talk to you about um, how we take apart these scatters of chip stone to try to identify, for example, um, household features. Just to show you some pretty paleo Indian artifacts on the top, here we have a sample of projectile points, beautiful, beautiful Folsom points, fluted points, basally ground on the edges. And like a typical campsite assemblage, what we're looking at here are mostly basal fragments. So imagine people living here in the wintertime, they're going out hunting, breaking off the tips of their points, bringing the spears back, tossing them out at, at the site, and replacing them with new points. So you're seeing at the top there broken. Uh, Folsom points that were used elsewhere. And on the bottom, you're seeing preforms or efforts to manufacture new Folsom points to replace those, most of, of which broke during the process of, of manufacture on the bottom, those preforms. We have a beautiful assemblage of cores, probably the rarest kind of Paleo-Indian artifact in my, assembly, uh, my opinion. Uh, the core assemblage from Barger Gulch is really interesting if you're into if you're into that kind of thing. I like lithic technology, um, and it's a, it's an amazing assemblage of cores. I think there's about 75 of them from the site, and on the bottom a small sample of, of bifaces and a large assemblage of bifaces as well. And there's a huge assemblage of, of flake tools, on, and this is just a very small sample on the top. End scrapers, which we think are used for for processing hide, and on the bottom gravers where you. We've made these very fine, sharp tips. Um, I'm not sure what they are. Uh, used for a student of mine, Spencer Pelton, has proposed that they're actually serving the function of awls and they're used in hide working and sewing. And I really, I really like that, that idea, although I really don't know. So this is somewhat unusual for a Paleo-Indian site. Artifact densities average about 459 pieces per square meter. We had some excavation units of more than 4,000 pieces. There's some Folsom sites that have fewer than 400 pieces in the entire site. So one thing that's really distinctive about this, it's certainly not unique to the site in the Folsom world, but that there's a lot of stuff here, a lot of artifacts, very high density. And it's pretty clear that what we're looking at here is a single occupation, not a site that was repeatedly occupied that people return to time after time after time. And what this tells us, we think, is that this is people spent a while. They, 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 they sat there for a while in, the, in this valley bottom, um, longer than, than they typically do in the early Paleo-Indian period. When we talk about Folsom peoples, we're talking about some of the most mobile people to have ever inhabited the earth. We know from early, the early Paleo-Indian period and from Folsom sites that Folsom people are regularly moving chipstone raw materials hundreds of kilometers across the landscape, and they're doing this on foot as pedestrians. And this is certainly true at Barger. We have non-local lithic raw materials moving into this site from hundreds of kilometers away. But once they got there, they settled down and they stayed there for a while. And we think, we don't know this because we don't have direct evidence to support this claim, but we think this is a long-term winter occupation where people moved into this valley bottom in the Rocky Mountains and spent the winter. The longer you stay somewhere, obviously, the more things you discard, and a lot of artifacts pile up. So um, there's little question that people spend a long, uh, uh, an extended amount of time at the site. When I say long term, I don't. It's hard to put a number of days or weeks or months on this. I see this as at least a month, and maybe as many as three. 
we know that it's longer term in a relative sense. It's longer term than most other, many other Folsom sites, the amount of time people spent there. And why we think it's winter is, one, the cost of moving around in the winter time for hunter-gatherers increases, which makes staying put um, a better option. And two, there's something interesting about Rocky Mountain Valleys or mountain valleys in the winter, which is when those mountains, the high elevations of those mountains um, fill up with snow in the winter time. All the large animals that inhabit this entire area get forced into valley bottoms into their critical winter range. So this graph you're looking at is the, the dense of the, uh, observations of mule deer in Middle Park seasonally. And you can see in the wintertime, the numbers of mule deer in the park increase dramatically. This is also true of elk. This is also true of pronghorn. And importantly, this would have been true of bison as well. So in the wintertime, sitting in the bottom of this valley, it's actually the best time to be a hunter because you can stay down there at relatively low cost. And at this site today, which looks rather uninviting because it's up here in a high ridge top exposed with no firewood, we think 12,500 to 12,800 years ago, there was actually a convergence of resources. One thing that's really abundant in this area today is church, troublesome formation church. This site is sitting on a geologic deposit from the Miocene called the Troublesome Formation. It's absolutely full of high quality chert. That chert that most of those artifacts are made of is available very close to the site. Barger Gulch itself is a spring fed perennial tributary of the Colorado River that's not far that would provide water. We have good evidence for, for coniferous trees growing on the site in the terminal Pleistocene and early Holocene from charcoal that we find in these sediments. So we think there was firewood there as well. And there's good ecological reasons to believe that there was lots of large mammal hunting to be had in the cold season. So we think this location provided a nice convergence of resources and the kind of place where we'd expect people to spend a longer amount of time. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit and look at these excavations. I want to start with a simple question of hearth features and how I identified hearths. And I have to tell you, just like our architecture in the Paleo-Indian world, <laughs> which is largely invisible, the hearth features are as well. In fact, the first hearth we found at Barker Gulch, we dug right through it. We totally missed it. We did not see it in our excavations. We found it in the lab. Once we figured out how to find these hearths, then we, we got better at identifying in excavations, but it was totally invisible. And this is not uncommon for mobile hunter-gatherer sites. When you have surface features, they're not ringed by stone, they're not slab-lined, the site is shallowly buried, it's highly bioturbated. Any geomorphic evidence of, of a hearth feature is very, very, very subtle. Um, I'll show you what the best, one of the best hearths we, we found looked like. Here's one of the hearths from the, the hearth from the east block. It's barely recognizable as a, um, a slight darkened stain where you have charcoal stained sediments and you can see a little bit of oxidation there. But I'm telling you, even this is complicated because so much natural burning affected this site after people moved out because you had conifers growing on the site. They burned every, about every 500 years naturally. It's really hard to identify hearth features. So what we discovered was that hearths are actually more easily identified in artifact assemblages than as features in the ground. And in fact, since, since our work at Barger, there was a classic paper published in the Journal of Archaeological Sciences by some archaeologists working in the Mesolithic in Northern Europe, and they talked about invisible hearth features, and they were identifying hearth features essentially the same way we, we did, which is as concentrations of burned materials. So we're going to look at a lot of maps as we move forward here, so bear with me, okay? So one nice thing about the, the raw materials, lithic raw materials that these folks were using is they show clear evidence of burning. When they're heated to high temperatures, they fracture in really unique ways. So you can tell when the artifacts, the chipstone artifacts, were exposed to very high temperatures. And I'm meaning, by high temperatures, I mean 400 degrees Celsius and above. And on the top left here, you can see when you look at the density of burned artifacts in our east block, there's burned artifacts throughout, but in the middle where we identified the hearth features is a really high density of burned, highly burned artifacts. And on the bottom, this corresponds exactly to the same area where we have really high densities of burned bone. If you look at the percentage of burned artifacts, the pattern remains, although it's a little different, it's kind of interesting. We have high percentages of burned artifacts. This is so raw numbers of burned artifacts here on the left, percentage on the right. The hearth also shows up as having a high percentage of burned artifacts, around 40 to 50%, but it's not unique that way. In areas 
peripheral to the hearth, out on the outside of this block, we have also high percentages of burned artifacts, although we don't have high densities of them. What that tells you is out on the periphery of this block, we, we don't have a lot of artifacts, but what we do have, they, a lot of them tend to be burned, which is kind of curious. So we're going to come back to that pattern in a bit. One thing that, that became really apparent at Barger is this really interesting relationship. Okay, so what you're looking at here is our, again, our east block excavation. Every dot here represents a 50 by 50 centimeter excavation quad. So we take a one by one meter unit, we divide it into four 50 by 50s, and we dig one each, each one independently. So on the right here, we're looking for each of those 50 by 50 centimeter excavation units where we have hundreds of lithic artifacts, the artifact density versus the percentage of those artifacts that are burned. And there's a really peculiar pattern there. Is it what we call an inverse relationship between artifact density and the percentage of burned artifacts? You see this sort of wedge-shaped distribution. What it tells you is where you have a lot of artifacts out here on the right side of this graph, it's a whole lot of artifacts, not many of them are burned. Where you have very few artifacts, well, sometimes a lot of them are burned, sometimes very few of them are burned. And you end up with this wedge-shaped distribution, which is really interesting. How does that form? One thing that became very apparent is that when you make this pot and you look at the excavation units that are outliers, you see this one peculiar unit that's acting strangely that has sort of a medium artifact density and lots of burn stuff. That marks the heart. Hearths can be really easily identified at Barger that way. We see here's our main excavation block and we see exactly the same pattern, this wedge-shaped distribution. And then these five outlying units here, those correspond to two hearth features in our main block. So hearths jump out immediately in the lithic assemblage. In the lithic assemblage, just by analyzing all these lithics, you can identify the location of hearth features. This one here in the center is the one we, we totally missed in the field. This one we identified in the field and it was confirmed again later by this method. Then in our, uh, our south block, the same pattern remains. So this is how we are able to identify hearth features at Barger. Now let's talk about houses and how, how I started to think about household identification in the archaeological record. And the simplest way to do it, and this was really inspired by the work of Dick Staper, who's a, a Dutch archaeologist who works in the Mesolithic and the Upper and Middle Paleolithic as well, uh, this idea. And, and, and the basic idea is that houses have walls. Walls, at the time they were present, were spatial barriers. Walls were popular topics of discussion four years ago, right, in the political world, because they serve a clear function, right? They, they serve as barriers. Their purpose is to keep some things in and to keep some things out. We can imagine in the hunter-gatherer household, the function of a wall is to keep heat in, for example, to create a microenvironment in which to, to live, to keep cold out, to keep rain out, to keep snow out, and to keep heat in. Um, sometimes to keep people out. Sometimes to create a private space, to keep prying eyes out. Because they're barriers, they should have archaeological consequences. We expect different things to happen on either side of a wall, right? So therefore, this should be reflected in the spatial distribution of materials in archaeological sites, even if those walls are long gone. If you think about the wall you're sitting next to right now, if you have an exterior wall to your house, very different things on the inside and on the outside, right? So this is the basic idea, is that walls should have archaeological consequences that are identifiable. And specifically, what I'm looking for here are breaks in spatial patterning. We're looking for changes in the spatial distribution of things in archaeological sites, and not just breaks but breaks that conform to what we'd expect a hunter-gatherer house to look like, no matter what that house was made of. We know from having studied hunter-gatherer architecture cross-culturally for a long time as anthropologists, what hunter-gatherer houses look like. Certainly there is a lot of variation, but typically wall features should be linear or curvilinear, meaning two-dimensional features. They should be continuous, Right? If there's a break, it's going to maybe um, uh, identify. Um, you might expect there to be a, a break, for example, for a doorway. But generally speaking, we're talking about a continuous linear feature that should be of the appropriate size and shape 
to be within the range uh, of structures built by hunter-gatherers. If it's 40 meters large, it's just too big, right? And if it's one meter in diameter, it's too small. So typically two to six meters, something in that size range, continuous linear break that's probably oval around, although certainly could be in other shapes. Um, and, and ideally we're gonna find these breaks in spatial patterning that are repeated in spatial patterns across the site. So we know we're looking at a repeated spatial phenomenon. So that's the basic idea here of how you find houses in hunter-gatherer sites where houses are long gone. Okay, so let's return to this basic as, as, a, as a starting point for thinking about this idea for finding walls in the archeological record. Let's look, go back to this wedge-shaped distribution. So I noted here that hearth features stand out as these outlying areas of the site that have relatively high densities, um, or, so medium densities of artifacts and high burning percentages. The way that happens obviously is you have people sitting around these hearth features and they're flint napping. And some of those materials are ending up inadvertently, I think, in the hearth features, causing them to show evidence of burning. But what about this other general pattern, this um, wedge-shaped distribution? Where does that come from? Well, it's a pretty simple idea. And by the way, consider the simple fact that when we find any hearth feature in an archaeological record, it could have existed in one of two states, in only one of two states. It's an inside feature or it's an outside feature. There's really no other option. I suppose we could have a doorway hearth that sits on the boundary, but then we're to three options, right? So we look at any hearth, we can ask, is this an inside feature or an outside feature? All right, so the general inverse relationship. Here's how I started thinking about this. All right, in what context would we expect to have a whole lot of artifacts, high densities of artifacts, but very little of them burned? These excavation units here, I'm thinking, well, this is the places where probably the places where people are working and flint napping. This is the primary flint napping areas. This is primary flint napping debris. And how do you end up with low density areas where you have a lot of burned artifacts? To me, the most likely explanation for this is that people are actually cleaning out hearth features that happen to have burned artifacts in them and they're dumping them elsewhere. This is secondary disposal of hearth contents. And if this is true, we would expect these kinds, different kinds of spaces to pattern spatially where we have primary work areas and secondary refuse areas. And that's what we're, we're looking for. If people are working inside of their households and foot napping in them, and they're dumping materials from hearths outside of them, then maybe we could use this to distinguish between interior and exterior space. So we don't have to worry about this equation, but what I'm doing here is I'm combining these two very simple variables. How many things there are in an excavation unit and what percentage of them are burned into a simple measure that combines this into one variable that I call the density and burning index. And when we have low values of that, this shows a histogram or a frequency distribution of that for our main excavation block. Low values over here, if I'm right, would show places where people are primarily flint napping. High values over here on the right are areas where they're dumping hearth contents. Now let's see how this index um, patterns spatially. And we look at this spatially, it's pretty remarkable what we see. So on the left-hand side here is the plan map of chipstone artifacts. You're looking at, I don't remember how many thousands of chipstone artifacts that we um, piece plotted in, in the east block here. Again, this is about two meters at the top here. I think it's six meters across, about 20 feet. Okay, so thousands of pieces of chipstone associated with a hearth feature. So the density in, in, in burning index here, I've, I've reduced it to, to the simplest possible uh, map I can, which is sites, uh, uh, units that show a low value, less than or equal to 19, and units that show a high value greater than 19. So the big circles here are areas where I think hearth contents are being dumped or the hearth itself. And the small value here are areas, primary flint napping areas. And you can see a really, really clear and interesting spatial pattern, right? There's this area around the hearth that has low values. It looks like these are primary flint napping areas. And then on the periphery, high values where hearth contents are being dumped. Super cool and really compelling spatial pattern. Here we are in the main block, 
slightly lower density. So we use I slightly use a slightly different threshold value, but you see, at least with the central hearth in the main block, exactly the same pattern, right? The hearth shows up as hot. Then we have this work area surrounding it. And then this area where hearth contents are being dumped outside of it. A similar pattern associated with this other hearth in the north, northern part of this block, although slightly different, very long and narrow uh, kind of uh, pattern. And then hearth contents being dumped on the outside of that. Slightly different shape and size. This is our south excavation block. Very, very low density, but again, exactly the same pattern. We have a hearth feature here, a work area around it, and then hearth contents being dumped in a ring around it. Again, this really compelling repeated pattern around three hearth features. Now, what does that tell us? Well, we have the central area with high artifact densities and small percentages of burned artifacts around a hearth, surrounded by low artifact densities with high percentages of, of burned artifacts out on the periphery. <laughs> Suggesting clearly that people are cleaning up these hearths and they're disposing of materials secondarily on the outside are these houses. But what other aspects of these lithic assemblages could we look at to try to uh, support this idea that what we're looking at here are houses? So here's a really dumb, actually I like it, but it's a really simple idea. So rather than looking at raw artifact densities, how many things we found in each excavation unit, Let's look at artifact density gradients, meaning for every excavation unit, let's look at how many artifacts are in it and how many artifacts are in every, every unit surrounding it. The idea being that when, when we have very consistent artifact densities, there's a low gradient. We have rel there's really not any change in artifact density across space. But we have a lot of variation where artifact densities are changing rapidly across space. We have a high artifact density gradient, the kind of thing where you might expect if you had a wall. Okay, because you might have a lot of stuff happening on the inside of the wall, very little stuff outside of the wall. You could imagine the opposite situation too, where most activities happening outside and very little activities happening inside. Either way, we'd expect dramatic changes in artifact density across that wall. And if we look at this gradient, what we see is, is this incredible um, area of, of changing artifact densities that's just ringing the hearth, encircling the hearth. Uh, and the east block. And I can show you that exactly the same thing is true in the main block, exactly the same thing is true in, in the south block. Let's look at another really interesting spatial pattern in the lithic assemblage of the site. This just shows artifact size. And specifically what I'm looking at is uh, artifacts from screens. So we're screening everything that comes out of here, right? And we're collecting the artifacts in the screen. We're analyzing every single artifact that comes out of the screen. And here we're just looking at the average mass, put everything on a scale and weigh it, the average mass of artifacts that came out of our screens. This is the raw data on the left. And here I've just shown it as less than 0.08 or greater than 0.08 grade grams on the right. And you can see this area inside uh, and close to the hearth, very, on average, small artifacts. Once you get outside of that, on average, much larger artifacts. What is a clear pattern of size sorting, right? And what we think is going on here is they're cleaning the floors. They're cleaning these areas inside of the house and they're moving large things to the outside. In fact, this is a pattern that Michael Schiffer and his student identified a long time ago, that small things tend to escape cleaning because imagine sweeping up the floor of, of, a, of a house that's got a dirt floor, the very small artifacts remain the big ones. You pick up and you take them outside or you push them up against the walls of your house. And here you can see a very, very clear evidence of size sorting just by looking at the average size of screen artifacts. And here's another really interesting pattern that we did not expect to find. In fact, we didn't see it in the field. We found it after the fact. Evidence for floor preparation. So at Barger Gulch, the site sits on this slight north-facing slope that, gents, that gently slopes downward to the north at about five degrees. On the right, you're seeing for the east block, the, the con, a contour map of the map modern ground surface. And you can see it's, it's slightly sloping down to the north or northwest. But when we looked at the elevation of the Folsom occupation surface, and this was identified by simply 
finding the elevation of the peak and artifact densities in our excavation units and mapping that across space, the east block appears to sit, this east block hearth appears to sit in this bowl kind of shape where it's flat around the hearth. It slopes up steeply to the south. It's pr pretty flat to the north. How does that happen? How does that happen on the north facing slope? Did people actually level out this area around the hearth? Did they actually move sediments from, from one side, from the back side of the slope to the front to make a flat sleeping surface? As you might expect to do, if you've ever gone camping and looked for a place to put your tent and you end up camping on a slope, you know it's not good to live on a on a slope, right? And you end up sliding downhill every night. So are they leveling the house floors to build these houses? And in fact, if, when we looked at this in the other excavation blocks, this is our main block here around this hearth, you can see exactly the same pattern. Relatively flat around this hearth, it slopes up steeply to the south, slopes up to the, to the west, it slopes up to the east, and it's relatively flat on the north side, as if they're taking sediments from the south side, from the uphill side, and moving it down to, to prepare their house floor. It's not quite a pit house, but the floor is being leveled. Again, the modern ground surface in the main block on the right side. If we look at the south block, a very similar pattern again. They're leveling the ground surface here. It sits in this bowl where it's relatively flat around this heart, slopes up steeply to the back, relatively flat to the front, in an area today that gents, it slopely, slopes gently down to the north. Okay, so to this to me is pretty compelling evidence here that we're dealing with houses, Folsom aged houses. Regular repeated patterns around, around three hearth features. Again, this hearth seems to behave a little bit differently, but around the other three is very consistent patterns in terms of artifact density, density gradients, burning, and, and the shape of the, the occupation surface. So in order to, to define um, houses, what I did was I combined several variables into a single complicated statistical analysis that I'm not going to bore you with. I'm going to go through very quickly, but we can combine all of these spatial patterns and look at them simultaneously to try to identify the position of walls. And that's what we do. We take artifact density for every excavation unit, the percentage of artifacts in each of those units that are burned, the change in artifact density or the density gradient for each unit, the mean size of, of artifacts for each unit, and the slope of the occupation surface, meaning is the occupation surface flat or is it sloped? For each of these occupation units, we combine them into a single analysis we call factor analysis and it identifies two factors that allow us to distinguish between interior and exterior space on the basis of the percentage of artifacts that are burned, artifact density, and artifact size. The basic idea being that inside spaces at Barger Gulch are characterized by high artifact densities, relatively small artifacts, and relatively low percentages of burning. Outside spaces are characterized by the opposite um, attributes. Factor two identifies the position of walls. Wall, the location of walls are identified as places where you have high artifact density gradients, where artifact densities are changing dramatically across space, and where the occupation surface is relatively sloped. Because this is where we're getting outside of the house floor and it's very sloped. And when we map that across space, we see this. This shows that factor two and how, that, how that's mapped across these three blocks. And we can see these negative, highly negative values that ring the main block hearth here. We can see it again in the east block here. We can see it again in the south block here. And doing some really fancy statistics, I'm able to identify the actual location of walls. And this is my best, my best attempt to define actual positions of walls of households by applying exactly the same statistical methods to these three excavation blocks. And these are the reconstructions that we get. So keep in mind what I'm doing here. We're just looking at spatial patterns and the distribution of thousands of pieces of chip stone. And we get these really interesting repeated patterns. I will note that for three of these, for the main block, central hearth, the east block, and the south block, really interesting shapes that are consistent with hunter-gatherer houses. I know they look a little odd, but I mean, generally speaking, the round to elliptical, they're of the right size here, the dimensions in the bottom, about four meters by four meters. 
in the main block, about five meters by four meters in the east block, and about three by three, three and a half by three in the south block. They also have this really peculiar characteristic where on the north side, there are breaks in these reconstructions that to me suggest the positions of doors. And I can tell you more about doors if you have questions about that afterwards. If you apply the same method to this other hearth feature in the main block, you end up with this tiny little feature that's about a meter in diameter that's way too small to, to identify a household. So what we have here in the main block is a paired interior hearth feature and an exterior hearth feature. And in fact, we have artifact refits that link the two. So because of that, now this campsite starts to come into a little bit clearer focus. This is maybe what a Folsom camp looked like. Um, this was painted by Alan DeNoyer, who works at Archaeology Southwest in Tucson in 2006. If I were to have him paint it today, I would have him paint 10 houses. I don't know that there were teepees. I'm pretty sure they were conical or domed. Uh, they had fires in the center. Um, and I'm pretty sure they had north facing doors. And the, the, the circular campsite um, sort of camp ring um, reconstruction here is on the basis of combining excavation data with surface artifact data that we think we have eight to 10 households in a ring on top of this uh, ridge top 12,800 years ago. So what kinds of things can we do? And I'm, I'm wrapping up here. One, one little anecdote about, okay, now that we can see houses in a paleo Indian site, what kinds of things can we do? Um, what kind of opportunities become available? And this is, comes from a master's thesis by Andrew Zink in 2007. He now works for the uh, New Mexico Historic Preservation um, Division. And it's a really interesting little study he did of bifaces um, at, at Barger Gulch. What, what, what Andrew, what, what Andrew Zink, we call him Z, what Z was really interested in was looking at skill because it was evident from the bifaces at Barger Gulf that we had a range of skill represented. When you think of flint knapping skill in Folsom times, we think of high skill flint knappers, right? Because we know Folsom points are among the most difficult things to manufacture in terms of basic raw skill and producing a chipstone artifact requires an incredible amount of skill. And we certainly see that in the Parker Gulch, but we also see low skill flint happen, or so we thought. So what Andrew did was he recruited uh, expert nappers and novice nappers, including myself. I was one of the novice nappers to produce bifaces, to study attributes of biface, of bifaces that, that tell you something about the level of skill of the maker. So here we're looking at his, ex his um, experimental data, looking at error density, and I'll show you what errors are in a biface in a second, and, uh, and with the thickness ratio for expert here in white and novice uh, in black. And you see that these two variables separate novice from expert flint napping really well. Novice flint nappers tend to have a lot of errors in their bifaces. It's re one really nice thing about stone tools is they record the, the scale of the people who made them very clearly in the flaking of those tools. What you're seeing on the right is a Folsom preform, very high scale piece, it was broken, but absolutely no errors visible in that thing at all. So novices, a lot of errors, experts, very few. And then width to thickness, expert flint nappers make those big, beautiful bifaces that are big and broad and long and very thin. And novice flint na nappers make bifaces that are really small and fat because well, people like me who aren't good at flint napping, we can't properly thin by faces. We, and then we, we have a lot of errors, which makes it really further reduces our ability to make them thin. So we can clearly identify skill variation in by face manufacture. So I want to show you, for example, what a low scale by face looks like. And this is, in fact, one from Barker Gulch. Um, so you can see here, I'm going to indicate with arrows what we call errors. These are hinge fractures or step fractures. You can see on the right here, this is two sides of the same biface, where the flake was taken off at an angle, inappropriate angle, so the flake hinged out and produced this big step in the biface. And then once you do that, it's basically, it's really, really difficult to correct it and fix that piece, and you'll, you'll never thin it again unless you really know what you're doing. And you can see this biface is absolutely riddled with errors, not the kind of thing you expect to see in a Stone Age site where people are absolutely dependent on flint napping to make a living. 
with the thickness on the left, you can see low scale bifaces. You can see the, the big hinge fracture right on the face here. If we turn that sideways, you can see how fat it is. It's a short, thick biface, really, really low scale piece. On the right, a high scale biface, you see hardly any errors on that thing. You turn it sideways and it's beautifully, beautifully thin. And, um, and in fact, when we look at this at Barger Gulch spatially, what's really interesting, so here's the same plot, but now I've added the archeological data to it. So in blue, we're looking at bifaces from the main block. And you can see that virtually all of the bifaces from the main block here pattern on the uh, expert side. There's one that's sort of right on the cusp between Andrew's uh, experimental novice and expert bifaces. So, but in the main block, pretty much all all expert bifacial work. In the east block, we have a range. So in yellow in the east block, we have some really expert pieces in the east block, and then some really ugly low scale bifaces in the east block. And if we look at these spatially, some really interesting patterns as well. So again, the main block, the, the high scale ones in white, we have one sort of probably high scale piece, but on the cusp here in the main block associated with exterior heart feature, a bunch of high scale pieces from inside the house. In the east block though, not only do we have a bunch of low scale um, napping, but it patterns spatially. The low scale stuff is occurring preferentially on the north side of the hearth and the high scale stuff on the south side. And when you see this mix of scale, what are we looking at? Well, it should be obvious to you what we're almost certainly looking at here is children. Where would kids be allowed to fun nap? Well, probably where they can get their own raw material. And, and Barger Gulch is a place like that. You can take a short walk and get your own raw material. They're sitting there for the winter time. And we think we have kids practicing their flint napping. And now we can see, we think in this site, super cool, right? In the main block, we pretty much have the evidence of adult high scale flint napping. In the east block, we're probably looking at a mix of adults and children, or at least one child in the east block household is flint napping and doing it on one side of the heart. So we can maybe start to see the way this space is being divided up by members of that of that household. And I will note another interesting thing about this East Block house, where we can identify this incredible range of skill in the biface. It's also the biggest house, suggesting more occupants. It also has by far the highest artifact density, suggesting more people over there producing more stuff and more artifacts, more artifacts piling up. And then you start to imagine a different kind of Paleo-Indian world, one that's not just about bison hunting and the manufacture of, of fluted points and highly mobile people. Um, but now we start to be able to see, you know, that we're looking at houses in which families of, of a diverse demographic group lived. And in fact, this is a, a draft of an illustration that I'm commissioning for the site. This is not what the final one's gonna, gonna look like, but showing um, a young boy practicing flint napping, sitting in a house in a house at, at Barber Gulch. Um, and you can see a baby hanging in a cradle board there and a man uh, and a woman. Um, and it, and it, to me, once you start looking at these residential sites and imagining houses, uh, a, a true, a much more human version of paleo Indian existence starts starts to to emerge. So to conclude, um, because walls are barriers to spatial behavior, I think they can be recognized um, in the archaeological record as, as breaks in spatial patterning. And at Barker Gulch, Barker Gulch is really a unique and ideal situation for doing this. And I don't think you're going to need the right kind of site to do this. And Barker Gulch is a really good site for doing this because it's a single occupation. It's high density. So spatial patterns are really obvious. We have clear division between work areas and, and refuse areas and house floors were leveled. So we can really pick out these walls at the site um, quite clearly. In my opinion, at the moment, these are the oldest known houses in the new world. I don't think that claim is going to last uh, much longer. But more importantly to me, I mean, aside from the story of what we can tell about Barger Gulch, to me, what's really interesting about this idea of, okay, we can actually see houses where they're not actually visible as direct archaeological evidence is this potentially opens up the opportunity to study uh, household spaces and to look at variation in domestic spaces and hunter-gatherer sites, not only in the Paleo-Indian world, not only in Colorado, not only in the new world, but, but really, really in, around the world if we start to think about about spatial patterns um, in this way. So that's my story and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Todd. That was a fantastic talk. And I was just texting with Liz. Um, there was so much great science in there, but the arc that you give in the talk and the way that you explain things was um, was super. I understood all of it. And I was dubious when you started being a Pueblo archaeologist <laughs> about how you were doing this. I was unfamiliar with this work and I really appreciate it. We have great questions um, that came in from this talk. And, um, and I'm going to start with a couple of that, um, well, with one that just really piqued my interest. And it was it was about the method in general of finding walls um, and two questions about it. One is, um, have you tested this in places where walls are known to have existed to see if you get the same patterns as just sort of a scientific modeling exercise? I have not. This, this would be a wonderful thing to do. In fact, I'm desperate to know if this pattern exists anywhere else. One of the hardest things about applying this basic method to other sites is that people don't make their data available. Right. You have to have the right kind of data, right? I mean, you have to have sites dug at the right scale, 50 by 50 centimeter quads, and people have to publish those data or make them available. Um, but that opportunity is out there for that kind of research to be done. I can think of it's wonderful sites where it could be done, um, but no, I have not done that yet. I will tell you that um, this other site that I'm digging with my colleagues right now, Lapel Mammoth site, much lower density, Clovis site, mm -hmm. see very similar patterns around one of the hearth features there. Um, although in order for these patterns to be visible archaeologically, you have to reach sort of a critical density um, threshold. And at this Clovis site, it's a much shorter occupation. But we start to see this pattern emerge there. Yeah, that makes sense. It's It's a mix of the precision and carefulness of their excavation and just of the depositional situation. So do you think it can only really be done in these long-lived seasonal or longer sites? Or or do you think there's some hope for a shorter-lived site? Again, I think it's really, I mean, if, if we forget about the specific way that I do it and think about sort of the general principle, which is we're looking for breaks in spatial pattern mm -hmm. in anything, right? Whatever the archaeological record looks like whatever you have there in the archaeological record, whether it's potsherds or bones or, or anything, um, it's, you could potentially do it if you had critical artifact densities, high enough densities to identify those breaks. Um, but I would guess if your densities aren't high enough, you're gonna end up with sort of an ambiguous signal. Now, that said, you, were, you said you were dubious when I started. I, I think it would still be fair to be somewhat dubious at this point yeah. uh, as well. Although I would say that if you, if you find these repeated spatial patterns around multiple hearth features in a hunter-gatherer site, it's hard to imagine what else we're looking at. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's a real testament to really careful excavation. I, I, I loved it. No, I'm pretty. I'm. I find it real compelling now. <laughs> um, here's a question that's sort of a practical question that came in from several people when you were mentioning uh, locating doorways, and that you seem to have found a pattern that suggests they were on the north. Um, why, why is that? A lot of people wrote in and said, north, gosh, you don't get any sol good solar radiation. North winds would be cold. What is it about the north at this particular site that, um, that makes that sensible? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I anticipated that question. I have a couple more slides to speak to that. And I'll show you in a second. But, you know, the first thing I'll say is that when we, when we found north facing doors, um, I thought the same thing. I thought they should be facing south mm -hmm. um, to let the sun in, or they should be facing east to let the morning sun in. And I started looking cross culture at where, how hunter gatherers position their doors and the kinds of things that determine that. And there's no simple answer. There are hunter gatherers camp in circles, and the position of your door is based on where you are in the circle, and you face your door inward. Mm -hmm. I knew face their door upstream on Sakhalin Island, and depending on what side of the island you're on, that's you know, the door faces uphill. Um, in the Arctic, I've seen uh, you want your door downhill or you want your door perpendicular to the wind, or sorry, downwind or perpendicular to the wind because you don't want snow drifts accumulating behind it. <laughs> There's many ways you might think about situating a door. At Barger, the simple answer is it's the downhill side. So if you're digging your house floor into a slope surface, the south side is now a really steep step up. 
if you want to exit that house, it's you, you exit easily on the north side. Um, and let me show you if, if you don't mind. Am I still screen screen sharing? You are. You are. Take it away. All right. So two other ways we can look at the door. One way is that um, obviously I mentioned these breaks in the in the reconstruction of the walls are all on the north side, which is interesting. Um, but this is really wild. So when we map these artifacts in place, we measure the long axis orientation, meaning that if you have an artifact that's really long and skinny, we put a compass on it and we say, is that artifact, we do it in the direction it's dipping downward, we say, is it pointing north, south, east, or west? And what we're looking at here, these arrows show areas of the site where artifact long axis orientations have non-random orientation. And all the places that are heavily intensively used in the site tend to show non-random artifact orientation. And it looks like that's because people are in contact with the ground surface, moving around on it. And this is a process we call scuffage. And in all of these door areas on the north side, we see preferentially oriented artifacts perpendicular to the direction of the wall, suggesting that the movement of people through these spaces is causing the artifacts to indicate how people are moving through. And you see that consistently on the north side. That's pretty wild, and I don't understand if you'd be skeptical. But so here's another thing that indicates north-facing doors. And the simple idea was that if people are taking artifacts from in, inside the house and dumping them outside, they're most likely to do it close to the door. Think about taking a rug outside your door and shaking it out. Therefore, if we look at the density of artifacts outside, we'd expect them to be highest on the side of the house where the doors occur. And this shows, the black colors here show where the highest artifact densities are outside of houses. And consistently it's on that north side. And consistently the lowest artifact densities outside of houses are on the opposite side. So all indications suggest north facing doors. And I think that's simply because it's the downhill side. It's the easy side to, to go out. Right. That's, that's just, it's just incredible um, that, the innovation that y'all have put into this. And <laughs> I mean, you had to, and and it's just, it's just incredible. Um, you see, you see why so much in terms of archaeological innovation has come out of archaic research. Um, yeah, their studies. Yeah. Our methods. Yeah, um, we have such a depauperate record. We have to, you know, find ways yeah, to pull information out of it. Yeah. Scuffing, scuffage. I'm gonna remember scuffage. Um Here's a here's just a, a, a general question is, you know, you did an incredible job of walking us through your whole process of um, of excavating this site in such a painstaking way as to allow you to make the um, make the findings that you did. How did you find the site, though, when you're coming across a 12,000 year old site? A lot of people want to know, um, how, how did you locate this initially? That's a great question. Um, simple answer is I didn't. And like like almost all of the most important Paleo-Indian sites, they were found. This one was found by Jim Chase and Wanda Schmars, who are um, avocational archaeologists who live in, in Granby, Colorado, who have been just incredible about sharing their information um, with the University of Wyoming. Um, mm -hmm. In 1995, University of Wyoming was working before I was at the University of Wyoming, in fact was working at another locality of Barger Gulch and Jim Chase was out there as an excited fan and was walking around the nearby ridges and found a couple of Folsom preforms over there. And that, that launched this project. Yeah, that's, it's great. It's great that people were willing to share that, um, that place. Um, okay. Sorry. I'm looking through the questions right now to, um, to find the next one. One, you know, Here's a general question for people who are unfamiliar with um, with lithic artifacts. Um, several people ask, "What what is a core? Can you just briefly describe um, core tools, core technology, and um, and what that would look like?" Yeah, I know I, it's. I got I got no, but it's it's funny because I got excited about cores, but in the Paleo Indian world, people are like, "Yeah, whatever." Two <laughs> points, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so a core, like if you you make a stone tool. You start with rock, right? Like a nice piece of what we call crypto crypto and silicate or like shirt or flint, right? You pick up a piece of flint and let's say this is a piece of, let's say this is the piece of flint you pick up off the ground. Now I want to make a stone tool. I want to make an end scrape or something. So I take a hammer stone and I strike it and I remove a flake off the edge. All of a sudden this nodule of chert has become the core. The core is the piece 
that I strike to remove flakes. It's what we call the objective piece. That's the core. So you're striking flakes to remove flakes from this core. And then those flakes, we turn those into other kinds of tools. And then what's the core is basically what's left after you finish that process. And they're really rare in the Paleo Indian world because people generally don't move them around with them. The typical mobile toolkit that people, the mobile foragers carry with them are the, the tools in the flake blanks or basically a big flake that you might turn into a tool later. That's what you carry around with you. You don't carry around the big stone because by doing that, you end up carrying around waste material that's, and it's heavy. So you basically get it into usable forms that you carry around with you. But at Barker Gulch, at this site, where we're sitting right on top of this raw material source. We get to see all these wonderful cores. Um, you see that at other Paleo Indian sites near, near, near raw material sources too. Does it seem that all of the lithic material that was at this site was from that local source, or did you get some foreign materials? Uh, roughly 98.5 percent of it is the local material, troublesome formation chert. Mm -hmm. And then the non-local raw materials are really interesting. Um, they come from different areas. We have um, Franktown or uh, Franktown or Black Forest petrified wood from sort of between Denver and Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. It came up from the western plains of Colorado, sort of the foothills over the mountains. We have um, uh, Bridger Formation Cherts from northwest Colorado or southwest Wyoming, mm -hmm. uh, from hundreds of kilometers away, and we think we have. Um, some agates from Utah, in fact, from way down the Colorado River. Um, and this would suggest, in fact, and what's really cool is we have different non-local raw materials in each of these houses. And if they're contemporaneous and occupied at the same time, it's suggesting we have people from opposite sides of the Rocky Mountains coming together and spending the winter there together. It's not a big group moving in there together, but individual families coming in and spending the winter together from opposite sides of the, of the mountains. That's, that'd be really neat. Um, tell me a little bit more about the dating, because I, I had questions about this and several people have written them in. Can you talk a little bit about how, how it was dated, how much uh, datable material was found? You said pretty little. And then um, some of the additional arguments for why this was a single occupation as opposed to, um, as opposed to multiple sequential occupations. <laughs> yeah. Dating has been challenging. I mean, actually, there's plenty of material to date in the site. There's charcoal galore. We collected thousands of pieces of charcoal. Um, and initially, we were trying to date the site by dating pieces of charcoal associated with hearth features, and we were having a little bit of success, so we thought. But as you dated more and more charcoal from the, from the site, we found we couldn't distinguish between charcoal that was the product of natural fires and charcoal that was the product of uh, human occupation. Um, the bone that's preserved there has some collagen, um, but collagen dating attempts that we found, the collagen was really poorly preserved and producing dates that were really, really young. Um, beginning in the late 90s, early 2000s, people started experimenting with dating of calcine bone, which is bone that's been burned to temperatures above 700 degrees C. And, and what's interesting is calcine bone becomes macroscopically very friable, but chemically it becomes very stable and tends to lock in the carbon present in the burning atmosphere at the time it was burned. And in order to produce calcine bone, you have to be, the bone has to be in contact with really, really, really hot fires. And we've discovered from studying natural forest fires and things, forest fires can achieve those temperatures, but very rarely is any of the bone that's burned in forest fires burned at the point of calcination. So when you have these clusters of calcine bone associated with hearth features, we know that they're produced by humans. And when we date that, we get really, really old dates. Uh, 10,000 in, in radiocarbon years, 10,000, around 10,900 BP from two, uh, two different hearth features in this site. Um, we think they're good dates, but they're old. They're old for Folsom. Um, single occupation. Yeah, how do you do this? This is a really, really challenging problem with any archaeological site, especially one like this. And the simplest thing I can tell you is that when you have multiple occupations, um, Spatial patterns tend to become blurred because you have, you know, people living on top of, of, of prior occupations, and they're not going to live the same way and have the same spatial organization of the site every time. When you see repetitive spatial patterns around three hearth features that are exactly the same, to me, it's hard to imagine how that happens in multiple occupations. And I'll also say it's hard to imagine how a ring of hearth features occurs in a site 
where you have multiple occupations as well. It's certainly possible. Um, but to me, every indication is that we have a single occupation here. I will note that the calcine bone dates in the south block are about 80 years younger, calendar years, which could indicate we are looking at two occupations. But within each block, I would say it's pretty clear we're looking at a single occupation. Um, we had a couple of people who are clearly interested in, um, in botany. Can you talk a little bit about the macrofloral remains, if any, that were found there? I mean, you said you found a lot of charcoal. Um, any, any evidence, any other evidence of what these people might have been eating? <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, so we floated a couple hearth features and, and didn't get any, any seeds or anything like that. Yeah. The macro botanicals there are charcoal, 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 and it's wood charcoal. And in fact, we had Owen Davis identify at the University of Arizona identify some of it, and he said it was all pinus. He thought maybe ponderosa. That would be a little weird because it's not present in the area today. Hmm. Um, there are Douglas firs that grow in Gallery Forest, sort of nearby. Um, but again, imagine this this landscape um, being um, the time people were there, sort of. Um, a mixture, I think. Today, it's nothing but sagebrush and rabbit brush. I mean, sagebrush step. But at the time, people were there. Probably a mix of, of grasses and a, and a kind of an open open pot, coniferous gallery gallery forest. But in terms of food remains, we've got a couple of molars of um, clearly bison. Um, we've got a couple of large mammal bones that were falling apart. We had to cast them in plaster that are identifiable to skeletal element. Probably bison. One of the th projects um, I have a student who's getting ready to work on is trying to identify some of this really, really poorly preserved bone fragments using a new method called zooms or zooarchaeology by mass spectroscopy to identify other possible species that are present. Because if this really is as old as we think it is, there's potentially Pleistocene, extinct Pleistocene fauna in this site, which is not something we associate with Folsom, potentially camel, potentially horse. Um, but who knows? We don't know yet. Bone preservation is so bad, we, we, we just don't know yet. But in terms of macro fauna, that or macro flora, that's all we got, charcoal. Um, no doubt these people were eating plant foods, we just don't find it. Got it. Um, you, you mentioned Ponderosa and how it's not there today. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how, whether and how the environment might have been different um, 12,000 years ago? Sure. Um, so this is 12,800 years ago, mm -hmm. 22,000 years ago, we're at the height of the last ice age, mm -hmm. massive continental glaciers sitting on the continent in the Rocky mountains. We have cirque glaciation. We have Rocky mountain glaciers originating from the high peaks coming all the way down to the valley bottoms as much as like 15 kilometer long glaciers coming down these, these mountain valleys. By the time Folsom people are there, this glaciation is largely over and those montane glaciers have largely retreated and the climate has warmed and we're approaching, we're approaching modern climate in terms of temperature. But right around the start of the Folsom period, we hit the Younger Dryas and the Younger Dryas is this 1200 year period where the Earth's climate sort of reverses back to, to glacial conditions, especially in the North Atlantic, you see, uh, you see glaciers re-advancing, you see temperatures dropping dramatically. And if we look at the evidence of Barker Gulfs, we actually have very few sediments of this age, but the evidence we do have suggests it would have been a slightly more productive environment, a little bit cooler, um, probably a little bit wetter, though that's, that's debated. Definitely more grasses. When we look at the isotopic contents of the bison, it suggests they're eating a lot more grasses than are available today in the area, um, and, and a, a little bit wetter. So imagine uh, more of a grassland environment than the sagebrush step that we have today with gallery for, forests around, on these slight north facing slopes along, along Barker Gulch is how I would, how, how I would see it. I mean, it's a little bit challenging to reconstruct the environment in this site. There's a lot of good environmental data from the Rocky Mountains, but a lot of that comes from pollen cores up in the high elevations above 10,000 feet. And down in this, these valley bottoms, there's very little in the way of direct environmental records that we have to study other than say isotopes from, from bison, macrofloral remains, potentially phytoliths, which we have not studied. Well, I mean, that's why, that's why the charcoal data of, of species that are being used. I mean, the assumption would be that, that this wood, that their fuel wood is coming from relatively nearby. Um, and, and that might tell you some, I mean, a bit about, uh, about that past environment.
Yeah, but I can tell you that none of the charcoal that we have dated is as old as the bone dates. Oh. <laughs> so I think all of the charcoal that we have dated post-dates the occupation, okay. all of it. Yeah. Now, there probably is charcoal from the occupation there, but picking it out from the charcoal assemblage is, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't do it without dating it all. Sure. Um, I don't know. Because the hearth features are totally obliterated by bioturbation, right? So, so what I can tell you about the charcoal assemblage, it's really cool. We've dated, you know, like 20 pieces of charcoal. When you look at it, you can see that ridge top burned over and over and over again from about 12,500 years ago to, I want to say, 7,000 years ago, about every 600 years, a fire burned right across the site, um, which is interesting because I'm talking a lot about the spatial distribution of burn things in the site, right? But it's pretty clear to me that nature could not produce these spatial patterns no, in no, no. three different parts of this. Um, some of the same people who are interested in, in plant remains were also interested in groundstone artifacts, whether you found any um, and, and if there's been any analyses done of them. We did find groundstone. I mean, you know, groundstone in the sense of the groundstone you find in the Southwest, the classic groundstone in food production, and mm-hmm. grinding grains. No, we don't have that. Mm-hmm. We don't have, we don't have metat- metates. We don't have monos, but we do have some, we did find two stones that I think were for marrow processing, um, big hammer stones. But um, the ground stone that we have are little tiny tabs of sandstone that have this, this the slightest hint of grooves in them. And some of them have faint hints of red ochre on them. And I, they're graders. And we know we find these fairly commonly in, in early Paleo Indian sites. The only thing I know that they're abrading are the edges of full. Some points when you're making bifaces, you often grind the edge of the piece a little bit to prevent it from crushing when you strike it. Um, I suspect they were also manufacturing some bone tools, possibly needles and ornaments and beads. We have found these things at other sites, like the Lindenmeyer site, also in Colorado, they have bone needles and ornaments. We don't have evidence of those things from Barger. The bone is just too poorly preserved. But the groundstone we have seem to be these little tabs of sandstone being used as graders. Well, um, we're we're going on an hour and a half here, so we're going to call it. I've got one last question for you, and can you and it's can you tell us a little bit about um, about what's next for this site and for your research? Well, that's a great question. I mean, what I'm doing here in Dallas is uh, I'm writing a, a book. I just finished a book, in fact. I have a draft of a book about this project um, that I will be submitting for publication, hopefully by the end of the year, and maybe will be published um, in 12 months or so. But I will say, you know, that site, um, me and my colleagues, uh, Marcel Kornfeld, Nicole Agusback, James Mayer, and others, uh, we left that site when we felt like we had, um, um, we learned what we could. Digging more, we weren't, we weren't learning um, much more. Um, so it was time, it was time to put it to, to rest. Um, so there's plenty more to do with that site. I was just leaving for somebody else in future generations um, to do it. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Todd, for this incredible talk um, and for spending this time with us. Thanks, Doug, for being here and to the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society um, for, uh, for sponsoring this talk and bringing Todd, uh, Todd to this series. This was great. Um, thanks, Liz, uh, for joining us today. And, um, and we hope you all have a, a good new year, a safe winter, and we'll see you um, in January after the new year. Um, for our first talk as we resume these. Thanks to everybody who's been able to join us this year um, and be well. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me.